Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, uh, according to where you may be. My name is Dorothy Estrada Tank. I'm a member and currently vice chair of the United Nations Working Group on Discrimination Against Women and Girls. Thank you so much to the Asma Jahangir uh, uh, conference organizers. This conference centered on challenges to human dignity. And in that context, I would like to speak today about mainstreaming gender equality in the judiciary as requested by uh, the organizers. And um, I would like to start by um, referring to uh, the analysis that has been made from the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights and different bodies, including the treaty bodies, the CEDAW committee, uh, committee, as you know, dedicated to ensuring and supervising compliance with the UN Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, and then the special procedures, such as the UN Working Group, of which I have the honor of forming part. So what we would have to say uh, in first instance as to gender equality in the judiciary, judiciary is that it derives from the right to uh, gender equality in general, right? The right to gender equality between uh, women and men, between boys and girls, that is enshrined as a human rights in the CEDA uh, Convention and other instruments as part precisely of uh, the human dignity, our shared human dignity, which is reaffirmed in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and all human rights uh, instruments and standards. And um, in this sense, uh, the gender equality in the judiciary as derived from uh, the right uh, to gender equality uh, in general has been addressed uh, from different uh, instances. I would say that one of the first ones and most important ones uh, uh, that has been used as a door of entry to gender equality in the judiciary is the issue of uh, gender-based violence and particularly violence against women and domestic violence and the way judicial bodies have approached this uh, this problem, this human rights violation, this specific form of discrimination. And in this sense, uh, we have seen and the Office of the High Commissioner has highlighted that um, there needs to be, of course, a gender sensitive approach to this a view uh, that uh, enshrines equality in the uh, approach that the judiciary takes to these issues devoid of gender stereotypes for instance that women are exaggerated or that they want to harm uh, the spouse uh, the man the male partner or that they want to prejudice the children against the father and so on and so forth. These stereotypes that we see sadly reproduced time uh, and time again in different sentences and judgments regarding violence against women and domestic violence. Um, the High Commissioner has also uh, signaled that more analysis is needed in terms of the potentials and limitations of justice processes based on customary law. So we know that many countries allow for um, a justice to be uh, applied on the basis of customary law. If we think, for example, of the recognition of uh, the right to self-determination of indigenous peoples in different countries in Latin America and uh, different countries in Asia, as well as uh, you may know that uh, hold different customary systems. And while uh, certain uh, customary norms are to be upheld, for instance, as part of the right to indigenous uh, self-determination. Um, uh, the Office of the High Commissioner, as I say, has indicated, has highlighted that we also have to uh, be aware of possible forms of gender-based discrimination that may exist of course, not only uh, among indigenous or traditional communities, it exists in all societies, but we have to be careful that not by upholding customary law, we may be uh, endorsing certain traditions or oppressive practices. And of this, we have to be careful, of course, of having a respectful intercultural dialogue between indigenous peoples and members of the uh, majority groups in society. And, and of course, there's also a very strong 
um, a, a very strong movement uh, or movements within indigenous peoples and customary uh, communities or custom based communities to also, of course, en enshrine uh, gender equality and try to ensure it in uh, the judiciary or in different forms of informal uh, practice of justice within communities. But this is something that needs to be explored more and where more um, uh, research is uh, needed. So I would signal it within the context of this uh, conference as something in, that we may engage in more dialogue um, in. Um, it's also interesting to note that uh, uh, comprehensive interventions have also been um, um, requested or uh, recommended by the Office of the High Commissioner uh, to address both the causes and the impact of domestic violence. And this can be done not only through the judiciary, but definitely through uh, the judiciary as one of the actors to address root causes of violence. And this means approaching the subject, as uh, I mentioned, without gender stereotypes, looking at human rights instruments that uh, endorse um, gender equality to which the judiciary as one of the powers of the state is obliged to in terms of international human rights law. Another uh, element, another dimension to address is um, to, to also look at the role of uh, men and boys in ending domestic violence and this can also be approached from the judiciary uh, in, in terms of, of trying to ensure uh, more gender equality within the family and the UN Working Group on Discrimination Against Women and Girls uh, in one of its annual reports that, uh, as you may know, is one of our obligations to uh, present an annual report uh, w uh, centered on the theme of our uh, um, decision, of our choice, with uh, informed by uh, all the information, the documentation, the feedback we get from different actors, including civil society actors. And one of those annual reports was dedicated to um, equality and non-discrimination in family and social life. So, of course, gender equality, while we may see it um, uh, expressed and, and also gender inequality in certain decisions by the judiciary, of course, we can trace a line back to family and social life and um, patriarchal societies and structural patterns of discrimination. And if we want uh, this to change, including in the judiciary, we have to also change these cultural patterns in family and social life and to ensure that women and girls can participate in public and political life to also have uh, more egalitarian views and the views of human rights of women to be enshrined in the judiciary. And this means involving also men uh, uh, and male accountability into the dialogue and into the relationship. Um, I'd also like to uh, uh, highlight that there have been different um, manuals and guidelines that have been uh, drafted and that have been issued by different uh, bodies, the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights included, but also the Council of Europe. And I'm sure many of you may know also at the more uh, local or regional level examples uh, in this uh, direction. And I just like to mention that there's a gender stereotyping um, and judiciary a workshop guide. This is the title of a guide issued last year in 2020 by um, the UN Office uh, of the High Commissioner for Human Rights that you may be interested in consulting when trying to find practical ways and specific recommendations on how do we work to uh, uh, ensure gender equality and avoid harmful gender stereotypes in the judiciary. Um, there's also a guide in that sense uh, in Spanish for those of you who, who may be working or have partners uh, with your different networks that are working in the region and also on uh, eliminating judicial uh, stereotyping. So I can I can send these links to the organizers. I'd be glad to uh, for those of you who may be interested in consulting them. So all of this is related, as we are uh, saying, to the right to gender equality and the right to equality, more generally speaking, in international human rights law, but also to another fundamental human right, which is access to justice the right of access to justice of women and girls, the right to be judged on equal terms. Well, first of all, the right to have access 
to the judiciary. That's the first step, of course. And we know that there are many structural obstacles for women and girls to reach uh, the judiciary, judicial institutions uh, from uh, the geographical location of those institutions, from gender stereotypes, which um, consider that women should be left to the so-called private sphere or inside the home and sh who shouldn't uh, actually uh, perform what are considered uh, public uh, activities and much less uh, claim their rights, which may be seen as a rebellious or subversive um, uh, attitude. So uh, the first uh, aspect to ensure, and it's a state obligation, is to guarantee that uh, women and girls can actually surpass these obstacles and to actually eliminate these obstacles, both in the law and in practice that there may be, so that women may access the judiciary. And then once they are involved in, in a process uh, claiming their rights or, uh, or as accused parties as well, they have to be ensured that they are going to be, that their issue is going to be considered by the judiciary with equality, without gender stereotypes, and with a view to reaffirming human rights and even to subverting patriarchal considerations and to also building a culture of equality and of respect of human uh, rights of women and girls. In this sense, our working group on discrimination against women and girls, which is a, a special procedure within uh, the UN mechanisms to protect human rights. This working group is formed by five uh, experts from different parts of the world, from all uh, geographical uh, representations. The chair, the current chair of our uh, working group, Melissa Obretti, is actually from uh, Nepal, so uh, from the area. In my case, I'm uh, originally from uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, and so on. We have one from uh, Europe and the uh, um, Western group, uh, another representative from Eastern Europe, and another from Africa. Once we are elected by the Human Rights Council, we of course look at cases from all over the world, not only um, from our original region uh, where we are from. And as I said, we issue annual uh, reports, uh, and we also carry out visits to countries and in those visits, official visits to countries, we have uh, expressed the importance of judicial independence and of uh, ensuring gender equality in the judiciary. For example, in processes of transitional justice, when there is a uh, uh, a society that is emerging from a situation of conflict or from an authoritarian regime. Women's rights, this is also a chance for women's rights to be uh, pushed forward and to be ensured uh, in the judiciary through different uh, uh, specific considerations. One I already mentioned, which is how we address uh, uh, form different forms of violence against women, including sexual violence, economic violence, domestic violence, uh, psychological violence, and to ensure that there are rules that forbid these uh, um, uh, conducts and that um, perpetrators are brought to justice and victims are uh, helped and are um, uh, addressed with uh, equality. And this we have recommended in different uh, official visits uh, to different parts, to different uh, countries from different parts of uh, the world, Romania, Honduras, uh, Poland, Chad, uh, Samoa, Kuwait, uh, Hungary, even the US, and, and this may be interesting to highlight as well, the US that is not a party to the UN Convention on uh, Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, but that we as working group have the possibility within our legal mandate as established by the Human Rights Council to actually look at all countries that are part of the United Nations Charter, not only countries who are part specifically to the CEDAW Convention or to specific human rights treaties. And we also have the, the advantage of being able to look at these issues from the broad perspective of addressing all human rights norms applicable to women and girls, including in the aspect of mainstreaming gender equality in the judiciary. So we will look at the CEDAW Convention, but also the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, the UN Convention Against Torture, uh, the Convention Against uh, Enforced Disappearances, the Convention on Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and uh, pick and, and intertwine from there the different norms that uh, refer to different situations that women and girls 
encounter uh, in the judiciary and how to try to ensure uh, gender equality and eliminate these gender stereotypes. As you may know, this has also been part of the recommendations that are uh, sister procedure from the CEDAW committee has recommended in individual communications and in situations that have reached the CEDAW committee uh, uh, concerning precisely uh, gender stereotypes um, that affect the way uh, women are, are being addressed in the judiciary. And uh, in this sense, I would recommend for those of you interested to look at the case of uh, Angela Gonzalez Carreño against Spain, particularly. There are many interesting cases, but in that there's a specific recommendation to Spain uh, to, uh, to, to incur in training to the ju judiciary to elaborate and to draft protocols to uh, train uh, um, uh, investigative uh, authorities and also judicial authorities on how to eliminate gender stereotypes and how to incorporate a human rights uh, perspective and a gender perspective into their work. So right now we don't have time to go into the details of that, but uh, it's a case of uh, violence against women and the result of the recommendations by the CEDAW committee are not only addressing the individual situation of the woman and her and her daughter, um, but actually the more structural patterns and recommending transformative reparations that look at the institutional uh, obstacles that Angela uh, and her daughter found in the system. So this is an interesting case that is now also being applied in, in Spain in terms of uh, these trainings and working with the judiciary, with uh, women's groups and, and NGOs dedicated to these issues. And lastly, I would say that it's important uh, to also look at gender parity in judicial bodies. The UN Working Group has highlighted that gender parity uh, is an indicator of gender equality and that it is advisable and that, of course, in uh, societies, I mean, in all the world, uh, women are half or uh, more than half, a bit more than half of the population, and this should also be reflected in the judiciary. This is not to say that this uh, will be a guarantee for gender equality and human rights of women to be put forward, but it is a necessary re pre-requirement to actually um, bring women's issues. It's a, it opens a door to the possibility to bring women's rights issues to the fore in a more uh, constant way and to change the terms of, of the dialogue and the dimension and the way judges analyze uh, issues before them. So I would signal these different uh, suggestions, recommendations, documents uh, that I would also recommend looking to more in depth and what the UN Working Group and other bodies have done in this respect in more detail uh, in our webpage and what we are doing. And I'm sure all of you are documenting and working uh, on these issues. We look forward to maintaining a dialogue in this sense. Our 2022 report is going to be on girls and young women's activism. And we have uh, consults in the weeks to come on 23rd November uh, with the MENA region and in the coming days uh, for the Asia Pacific region. And we can also let you know and we look forward to maintaining this dialogue. And I thank you once again on my own behalf and that of the UN Working Group on Discrimination Against Women and Girls for your attention. And I wish you all uh, success in this conference. Thank you very much.